This is the story of TUI Flight 1665. On the 11th of September 2021, a Boeing 737-800 was on the way from Palme de Mallorca to Aberdeen International Airport. The plane had 67 people and 6 crew members on board. An hour and a half later, the pilots were in contact with Aberdeen Approach. ATC wanted to route the plane so that they would be making a Cat 1 approach to runway 34 at Aberdeen using the ILS. Before we go forward with the video, a quick word from our sponsor, Babbel. Their support makes these videos in this channel possible. Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the world. Look, I've never been the best at languages. I try and try, but most of the times, me and languages, we just don't mix. That is until Babbel came along. I've always wanted to give French a try because every time I'm in Quebec, it just sounds so fancy and I've always wanted to learn the language. So I started to learn French with the help of Babbel. The best thing is their courses are designed by real language speakers and is scientifically proven to help you start speaking a new language within three weeks. What I like about Babbel is that they try to teach you languages using real life scenarios and not just hitting you with a bunch of translations of random words from another language. If that's not enough, they offer a guaranteed 20 day money back guarantee. If you're looking to learn a new skill over the summer, why not learn a new language with Babbel? Get 60% off of your Babbel subscription with the link in the description. What language would you like to learn with Babbel? Let me know in the comments below. Merci à Babel de voir sponsoriser cette vidéo. That's French for thank you to Babbel for sponsoring this video. Comment est mon français? Now, back to the video. The ILS or the instrument landing system uses radio beams to guide the plane towards the foot of the runway. CAT-1 ILS is decently precise, but CAT-3 ILS is so accurate that with the right pilot, who is certified in CAT-3 approaches, the pilot can take the plane all the way in without even sighting the runway. The controllers let the pilots know that they might have to go around because on the ground at Aberdeen, a helicopter was about to take off on a search and rescue mission. And once that helicopter was airborne, the helicopter would take priority for obvious reasons. Thus, Flight 1665 would need to go around. With the possibility of a go-around, Flight 1665 continued with the approach. As the plane intercepted the localizer or the radio beam that helps the plane align itself laterally with the runway, the pilot had already prepped the plane to land. The flaps were out and the gear was out, and all that was now left was to fly the approach all the way down to the runway and land. But at 2600 feet, the controller warned the pilots to go around and to turn to 270 degrees. The helicopter now took priority, so the pilots pushed the engines to max power and the plane started to pick up some altitude. In a few seconds, the plane went from 2250 feet to 3000 feet, but then something strange started to happen. The jet started to descend. Now, this was the exact opposite of what should be happening at this point. The plane was supposed to be climbing away, not descending. It is, after all, a go-around. The plane started to drop faster and faster. At one point, it reached a descent rate of 3,100 feet per minute. At those speeds, the plane would impact the ground in less than one minute. Thus, the pilots did not have a whole lot of time to react. In the tower, the approach controller noticed that the plane was losing speed very, very quickly. So, he or she contacted the radio approach controller and warned the controller about the developing situation. Now, the radar controller acted as fast as possible and told the pilots about what was happening to their plane. In the cockpit, the pilots were already working on recovering the plane, and with some grunt, they did just that, pulling the plane out of the dive. The jet maxed out at 285 knots at the bottom of the dive. Now, just for some context, at this point, they were not supposed to exceed 200 knots during this phase of flight. But thankfully, the jet started climbing away safely. The pilots and all on board must have been shaken. It's not every day that a passenger jet just noses down for no apparent reason. As they put the plane into a left-hand turn, they made sure that all the systems were working as they set the plane up for another approach. Whatever had happened on attempt number one should not happen on attempt number two. Who knew if they'd be able to recover from that if it happened again? With the controller's help, they set up the landing and flight 1665 landed without any issue on runway 34 at Aberdeen International, much to the relief of the 73 people on board. But before we continue with the video, I'm a little bit curious. We often talk on this channel about accidents and near accidents. But if you were in a situation like this, what would you do? Just something to think about. 
But now we need to figure out what was happening to Flight 1665. How did a plane that was climbing away suddenly nosedive and almost end in disaster? The answer to that, as we'll see, started all the way back in 2020. The investigators had a few theories as to what happened on this instance. And the first one was a somatographic illusion. If you've been a long time viewer of the channel, then you'll know that we've talked about the somatographic illusion quite a bit before, especially in the case of Atlas Air Flight 3549. If you haven't watched that video, then I'll have that up on screen for you right now. But here's the gist of the somatographic illusion. If the plane accelerates way too quickly, the body will be tricked into believing that the plane is pitching up at a high angle, even if the plane is not. Now, if there were no visual cues for the pilots to rely on, then the pilots would be tricked into believing that the plane is pitching up when it is not. This might cause the pilot to erroneously push the nose of the plane down from a pitch up that was never really there. The flight data recorder thankfully collected data from all over the plane, and one of the things that it recorded was the position of the control columns and the inputs that the pilots were making. The data showed that slight nosedown inputs were made, but nothing that would cause the jet to nosedive. This was just what you'd expect to see if the plane was out of trim. So a somatographic illusion really did not cause the accident. They then looked at the go-around system on the 737 to see if that could have somehow resulted in what happened. On the 737, when you hit the toga switches, the computer will first check if all conditions have been met for a go-around. And if they are, then it will disconnect the autopilot if engaged, and the engines will be pushed to the go-around thrust. However, if the plane is under 2,000 feet of altitude, the behavior of the autopilot is a little bit different. If you hit the toga switches once, the plane will climb at around 1,000 to 2,000 feet per minute. If you hit the switches twice when the plane is below 2,000 feet, then the engines will be pushed to close to their maximum power for the go-around. If you're above the 2,000 feet limit, and if you hit the switches once, the engines will ramp up to, quote, full go-around and one limit. Here's the thing. The plane should have climbed to 3,000 feet and stayed there, but that did not happen. On the hunt for answers, the investigators then looked at the simulator to see if that would give them some insight into what happened in the cockpit of Flight 165. They wanted to see what the pilots of the 737 were seeing. They rediscovered something that they had known for a while. Due to the underslung engines of the 737, an increase in power would cause the nose to rise up dangerously fast. Well, the opposite was also true. The pitch up momentum would be so bad that during a go around, the pilot of the plane must slightly push the nose of the plane down till the plane gets properly trimmed to keep the nose from rising up too much. Now we have all the pieces needed to figure out exactly what happened to flight 1665. When the go around was initiated, the plane was well above that 2000 feet limit and the pilot remembered hitting the go around button once. Now, as we mentioned before, under these circumstances, the engines would ramp up to a very high power setting for the go around. And due to the design of the 737 with its engines being under the wings, the plane would nose up quite a bit. But here's the kicker. The pilots expected the plane to go into the other mode. Remember the one where the plane would climb at a relatively mild 1,000 to 2,000 feet per minute? Yeah, that one. But instead, due to when they commanded the go-around, the engines went full power. This caught the pilots off guard. Now, the plane is climbing and the auto throttle is engaged. And as the plane approached its level off point, the engines were pulled back from max power, and at the same time, the flaps were also retracted. These two things caused the nose of the plane to drop. Had the plane gotten within 3,000 feet, the autopilot and the flight director system would have gone into the altitude hold mode, which would have stabilized the plane. But since it did not get within 60 feet, it stayed in the altitude acquire mode, which does not stabilize the plane. So let's just recap what's happening here. The plane is climbing up rapidly because the pilots misjudged what would happen when they hit the go around button. The nose of the plane rises and the plane climbs quickly due to the engines being at a high power setting. Then once power is reduced and the flaps are retracted, the nose started to fall. But the plane does not stabilize itself because that only happens if the autopilot and flight director system goes from the acquire mode to the hold mode, which only happens if the plane is within 60 feet of that altitude. Okay, now we're all on the same page. To make matters worse, while all of this was happening, the pilots were absolutely swamped with work. The crew were complying with a lot of vector changes, and the first officer was busy responding to those radio calls, and this would have taken away from his or her monitoring duties. 
and the captain was manually flying the plane. While they were busy, they did not notice that the nose of the plane had dropped and that they were screeching towards the ground. At this point, one of the safety alarms on the ground should have kicked in and warned the pilots that their rate of descent was way too high. But the systems on the ground did not kick in and noticed that the plane was descending way too fast. We don't know why that happened. But the more important question is why didn't the pilots realize what was happening? Well, it all came down to COVID. COVID not only robbed us all of two years of our lives, it also robbed the pilot's ability to stay sharp. Well, you don't need me to tell you that due to the pandemic, pilots were not flying as much as they used to. But flying a plane requires that you be constantly flying to be current. If you take some time off, then it takes a while for you to get back to where you were before. To combat this problem, airlines like TUI relied on simulators. Now, simulators are great, but here's the thing, they're not perfect. For example, two-engine go-arounds are rare in the real world. For example, in the UK, you would have three go-arounds for every 1,000 flight. That's like one go-around per pilot per year, which isn't a whole lot. But the thing is, in the simulator, most of the go-arounds that they do are from a low altitude. They rarely train for a situation where you have to go around from a relatively high altitude. Add to that fact that neither of these pilots had done a go around in the preceding two years and you start to have a problem. I don't think anyone should be pointing any fingers at the pilots. To be honest, this feels like one of those Murphy Law situations. But that being said, this could have been a lot worse. These pilots were out of practice and it would not have taken much for a somatographic illusion to take hold. Planes have gone down for less. Take, for example, Canyon Airways Flight 431. If you want to see that, then you can find it on your screen right now. But do you think this could have ended in disaster? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I'll catch you guys next time. Stay safe.